But, um, so yeah, Dave, do you want to chime in with anything or give us give any little uh, updates? Sure. Uh I'll, I'll be fairly brief. I, I know that um, Brad and Tyler are going to be joining us in just a few minutes, I believe, to do the um, to do an outline and overview of kind of the field projects for 2022. Mm -hmm. But I did just want to take a moment just to update the commission on the Hickory Ridge project. I know that there was some correspondence from uh, concerned residents, and um, there was some. Um, um, there was an article in the Amherst Indy, and um, I'll be working with the with the town manager to um, address some of those concerns outlined in the email that was sent to you and the planning board and, and the town council in the next few days. I was off yesterday and part of today, so just coming back to that. But, um, you know, I, I just want you all to be aware, I mean, we town staff are, you know, very much you know, uh, um, involved with and and um, and concerned that um, you know we do the best job we can at oversight of that project. Um, it has been a highly regulated project. It has gone through the commission. It has gone through the ZBA. It's gone through the Natural Heritage Program. It's gone through the the Department of Environmental Protection. So this is a project that has been permitted over the course of many years. That does not mean that there won't be uh, things to address during the during the construction. Uh, every project, every construction project, whether it's a home or a resident uh, or a commercial building or a golf course or a solar site, uh, will have issues that do come up. But we are acutely aware that this is on town land and that we will do our very best to uh, to oversee that. Um, Aaron could jump in at any point, but. I also want to make sure that you know you recall um, that there will be an environmental monitor uh, on the site when the main part of the construction starts. Aaron and I are looking at this really in three phases, uh, if you will. Um, the tree clearing, which happened a couple of weeks ago, is kind of the, the early uh, pre-construction phase. Uh, AMP then needs to improve the bridge over the Fort River. So we'll we'll be overseeing that work as well as well as our building department, and then of course the the actual construction of the solar panels and the solar field, actually the two solar fields. So it's it's a project that we will be keeping a close eye on. Um, we have a good and transparent working relationship with AMP. I think there are some uh, concerns expressed about Dynamic, the company that is a, the subcontracted company to actually. Uh, construct the arrays. We know that they there have been challenges uh, on other dynamic projects in the region. So we'll, we're, we're aware of those and we will keep a cl close eye on um, the project from start to finish. I think the other thing, and I've had some um, emails and phone messages from folks recently about the tree cutting and um, we're gonna do a couple of things. We did send out something that's on our website and we had a couple of articles in local newspapers we're also going to be putting some signs up at the various trailheads to kind of inform folks of the start of the, 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 the main part of the project, which is when the solar arrays actually will be construction, constructed and construct, construction fencing will go up and, and those kinds of things. I think for many people who may not know the full history of the project, there's a feeling that, um, and honestly, I think we all feel it, it's a wonderful, beautiful site. Um, but the project was was permitted to happen by various boards and committees at the town level and state level. And so um, um, the solar will happen on the site. And I think for many people who may not know, again, all the history, there's this feeling that solar, why do we have to do solar at, at Hickory? And, and the, the short answer to that is that the town would not have purchased the property, would not have been able to purchase Hickory Ridge unless solar was already part of the project. We did not, um, we were not part of bringing the solar project into the project. That was already agreed upon long before the town purchased the land. So that goes back to the previous two owners. So the reason the town was able to get the property at $520,000, which is a, a huge bargain sale, was that solar essentially took 
a great deal of the value out of the land. So to purchase that land outright, as we did in, in um, March of 2022, would have been north of $2 million. And there is just no way the town ever would have moved forward with that. I can, I can tell you that we would not have had the CPA funds or other dollars to do that in this climate, in this uh, uh, funding environment. So we're very fortunate to have gotten 150 acres for $520,000. But one of the compromises in this agreement is that there'd be 26 acres of solar. So there will be some changes, there already are, with the tree clearing and then the, the actual solar. So that's a long-winded explanation. And you know we've been talking about this project for five years. So there's been hundreds of hours of discussions and negotiations and permitting process uh, behind us, but, but we still have a long ways to go here to make sure the project is constructed properly. So I just wanted to kind of put some of those points out there because I am answering a number of emails and a number of phone calls from folks who are asking, why do we have, why does the town have to have solar on the property? We came into the project at a point where solar was already predetermined on the site. There, there was no option for us to buy without solar on the site. So um, I just wanted to for some of you, that might be a reminder, but some of you who are newer to the commission, it's it might be new information. So happy to I didn't know it. that. Thanks, Dave. Yeah. That's really interesting background. Yeah, that pretty yeah. dated me. Thanks. Yeah, I think for a lot of folks, they, you know, some of the calls I was taking last week with the tree cutting and people are like, why is the town taking down all these trees? Why do we have to have solar? Let's just leave it the way it is. That wasn't an option. It wasn't, wasn't a deal. We would not have been able, it would have been in private hands and the solar project would have been happening essentially without any public component. Now, at least we own the 150 acres. We, we are planting trails. We're planting an ADA trail um, uh, on part of the land. We can plan for the use of the frontage where the clubhouse is. We can make the connections to the neighborhood and we're protecting in perpetuity. Most of the pro property will be protected in perpetuity. And never mind uh, the work on the Fort River. Through a, yes, and we're doing all this great work on the Fort River. And we're eventually, we will, uh, with your help and guidance, we will decide on a conservation restriction for a vast majority of the 150 acres. Uh, keep in mind that AMP has to um, uh, mitigate for their impacts with 17 acres of riverfront, um, riverfront, um, sorry, long day um riverfront restoration, restoration uh, uh for the mitigation so that is that that's on their their nickel their dime um so yeah they'll, they'll, there's a lot of benefits to this project but the compromise was 26 acres of solar um, yep. so that's and you're gonna um <clears throat> is there plans to cut uh, close close the trails obviously during construction or is, is the whole place going to be closed or how's that going to we're not we're we're not planning we're we're going to work with amp and dynamic to have signs up in various um uh, intersections if you will uh, of, of of existing trails so that essentially the the property would will be open except for those areas inside the construction fencing You're right okay. so the the whole south side of the property uh south of the fort river will all be open. There will be no construction fencing on the south side of the Fort River. It's really only on the north side where the two arrays will be constructed and probably the the um, um, the uh, um, uh, roadway uh, between them where there will be construction fencing. But other than that, the property will be open for cross-country skiing, dog walking, bird watching, running, hiking, et cetera. So we will be putting up some signs because I think there are some people who are new to the project and may not have kind of you know the, the more comprehensive history that that I do. And I think we just have to be open to that because many folks have just discovered Hickory and said, why do we have to do anything there? Can't we just keep it the way it is? And the answer is that was predetermined before we purchased it. Um, and course. we, yeah. Um, so. Thanks, Dave. I appreciate that. And uh, it's nice to hear there's some clarification yeah. um, from that, as you said, that, yeah. that was part of the deal. The solar was going in before we even bought it. Yeah. Could I just ask, amazing. 
Fletcher, could I just ask Erin, because she and I have had some conversations. Again, I, I really want to put the emphasis on we will be keeping a very close eye on oh. AMP and Dynamic. Um, both of those companies understand that this is a highly scrutinized project, that the, uh, the public will not be barred from the site. So everything they do will be out in the open. As you all know from knowing the site, um, uh, it is a very open and, and uh, easy to access site. So the public will be walking and I'm sure watching what Dynamic and AMP do. Um, and we will be as well as part of our permitting process. And Aaron, if you wanted to say anything about you know the next phase, which would be the work on the bridge over the Fort River. Yeah. Um so, you know, prior to the tree cutting, um, Dave and I did have a pre-construction meeting. And um, I think what I, the way I see it is there's going to be a series of pre-construction meetings. So the first pre-construction meeting was with the tree removal contractor. The second um, pre-construction meeting is going to be for the bridge contractor. There's going to be yet another pre-construction meeting for the road construction. And when ground breaks on the solar project, there's probably going to be yet another pre-construction meeting. I, Dave was at the meeting. Um, actually, Alex came to the meeting too. Um, I was very clear with these folks that we're going to be watching this, the public is watching this, that they cannot take any missteps and they must follow the permit. And um, I even quizzed them on it. I, I said, did you read the permit? And I quizzed them on it during the meeting. Um, so there's definitely going to be a series of meetings and I'm going to meet with every single contractor who enters that site. Um, and I think the fact that the public is open to enter the site is is really uh, <clears throat> the, the project's going to be monitored by an environmental monitor. I'll be monitoring as well, but the public can monitor. You know, the public out there walking, they can see what's going on. And so there's a there's a a lot of opportunities for us to oversee what's happening. And I think that that's um, something that's valuable on this site. Um, and I. One of the things I emphasized with these folks, and I'm going to emphasize again and again, is how sensitive this site is. It is an extremely sensitive site. The floodplains, the wetlands, um, the river. It's, um, it's. I told them all, this is probably the most sensitive site you will ever work on. And for that reason, uh, it requires a lot of respect and caution. Um, and also not, not just for the resource areas, but also for safety, because the river floods so frequently and the flooding can happen you know, in a very flashy manner, just a couple inches of rain and that river comes up quickly. So they have to be prepared for that and um, use caution and um, trying to just repetitively um, reinforce these things and have a continuous line of communication with them when work is going on out there. The day the tree removal was going on, I had four phone calls from Dynamic during the course of the day asking me specific questions about the permit and I said to her I don't care if you call me a hundred times a day just here's my cell phone just call me um, I would rather that you ask and be clear on something before moving forward so I'm going to do everything I can um, to make sure that I that it's done right and that we're um, keeping a close eye on things I appreciate that, if, uh, Dave I, and Aaron. Yeah in conclusion I just I just wanted to say something that um, reiterate what Aaron said about it is a very sensitive site, but the topography of the site is dramatically different than many of the other sites that solar has been proposed or built on in other parts of the of the region. So through the permitting process, and I want to kind of reiterate that, again, there are, you know, uh, wetlands permits, ZBA permits, natural heritage permits, DEP has reviewed all of that. And then there's also a lease agreement with the town of Amherst. So Work can only go on in three areas of the site, 150 acres. The only areas that work can go on through AMP and Dynamic are the access road uh, to the river, and then the road to the Eastern Array, between the arrays and the Western Array. So AMP is very clear that there's no work to be done anywhere outside of the leased area. And the area outside the leased area is some of the most, as Aaron said, some of the most sensitive areas, you know, on the site, river, riverfront and wetlands and vernal pools and, and the like. So I just want to reiterate kind of the layers of permitting, but also the layers of review that this has gone through. And uh, again, there will be bumps in the road, but every project has those. But 
we will be um, watching closely and I'm sure that the public will as well. So thank you. Any well, other you questions while you have us? We will be communicating information to the town council, um, the planning board, anyone else, and any of the, the members of the public who might be uh, concerned or interested as we go. Yeah, quick question. Uh, we're uh, we're going to be discussing that uh, letter a little later on. Is that correct, or is this part, uh, is that going to be part of the uh, discussion to, uh, right now? I just took my time to maybe try to front load that that address. If there are any other questions later, Andre, I'm happy to take them whenever Fletcher works yeah. them. Are you, you have sense that something that's really needs jumping out there, Andre? Because I'd like to get moving with. Oh no, not at all. I was just uh, just I, I don't want to talk about the letter if we're not going to talk about it. That's Thank all. you. Yeah, and uh, I, I think Dave, Dave, I think I'll just add one thing to uh, to what you were saying is because of the fact that this has been going on for about five years or so. That's why we were hearing during our last uh, uh, discussions about uh, cutting the trees and so on that, yes, this has been approved already. Um, so I just, for, for anybody who didn't catch that there, that's, that's, that's that. But Thank you. Just, Thanks. I just also appreciate uh, Dave and Aaron, the due diligence you're doing on this. And I know your eyes are gonna be on it and I understand. Um, you know, these contractors have got to show show up and you guys are going to hold them to it. And we appreciate that. Yeah. And we appreciate the input from the public. So please, if if anyone listening on this call, any commissioners, again, the land is not going to be the, the, the benefit here is it's public land. This is not a private site. It's not a off the beaten path, 150 acres. So if anyone sees anything, if anyone's concerned about it, please email or call Aaron or myself, commission members, members of the public members of any boards or other Amherst boards or committees, please call us, email us, and we will get back to you. So we appreciate that. We can't be everywhere all the time. So we appreciate it. Right. We're good. Um, is, is Brad and Tyler in the, uh, in the house here? Yep, I can move them on in if that's okay. Yeah, if you could go on mind controlling that, I'd appreciate that. Of course, that. of course. Then, um, um, Fletcher, I'm also going to make you a co-host just yeah, because okay. once I get into sharing my screen, um, I won't be able to see the attendees if a hand is raised. Yep, so if gotcha. um, once I'm sharing my screen, if you could just keep an eye out for that. Yeah, we will do. Thank you. There's Tyler. What's going on, Tyler? How are you? Good, man. I apologize. I, uh, I got home, was getting ready to hop on this meeting and... We lost power, so I had to go from to my way from home to, to sit in on this. So it's a little little building, but we'll make it work. <laughs> so you got internet and light. That hey, does the heat work? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so. All right, how you doing, Brad? Joyce in Worthington. <clears throat> I'm good. How are you? Good, good. Thanks for um, coming, you two. So um, if you guys just want to take it away, share a screen, and um, give us the lowdown of what's going on, we'd, uh, we'd greatly appreciate it. Brad, do you want me to share um, on my screen, or would you prefer to? No, if you don't mind, I would appreciate it. Thank you. OK. <clears throat> Is this OK? Yeah. All right. So uh, I guess for those of you who don't know me yet, my name is Brad Bordewick. I'm the land manager with the conservation department. And I've been working for Dave Zomek for about 13 years. I graduated from uh, the Arbor program at the Stockbridge School of Agriculture and the forestry program at UMass. But uh, it's been a while since we last met. And I think Brendan was actually the assistant land manager at the time. And he's since moved back to Minnesota to be with his family. So some of you may not know Tyler yet. Um, Tyler worked for the town previously back in 2017 through about 2020. He's also an alumni of the Stockbridge School where he went through the agriculture program as well. And he's an avid outdoorsman. So uh, meet Tyler. <laughs> Hi everybody, nice to meet you. So, uh, 
this was a kind of a neat little picture actually it's uh Snow it's on the robert frost trail in the lawrence swamp and you can see that's a moose that we came across so we were doing some trail work which was kind of cool it was actually it had a calf following her which was really neat but uh yeah so lots of different animals use our trails i think we can go to the next one Tyler and I are kind of going to go back and forth here. So Tyler, if you want to tackle this one. Sure. Yeah. So we got our, uh, the, the tree work that we tackle on our trail systems uh, town wide. Um, these are a little bit of the, the more challenging ones. I think we have pictured here, but we get them of all shapes and sizes, um, especially in the frequent windstorms that we experience um, quite frankly, throughout the whole the entire year, um, just the other day, as you probably all recall, um, over the weekend, really, really high winds. So obviously that uh, that causes things to come down and be, uh, you know, prohibitive to, to crossing our trail systems. So um, we find them as we're out and about uh, on our daily duties, um, doing different types of work uh, throughout our conservation areas. Um, we also get a lot of reports of them from avid trail users as well, which is very helpful to us because um, there's a staff of two of us and we can't be everywhere at one time. So um, we uh, compile lists throughout the year and, and actually now in, in the February winter month here um, is a great time of year that we try to get out and, and knock a lot of, a lot of those trees out um, to make the trails passable again. All right, so this is the interpretive trail signs that we've been doing. Um, actually, the bottom left one is uh, is the storybook trail that's been installed for a little while now. I don't think we talked about it the last time, but um, it's kind of a neat thing that we teamed up with Coles on where families can kind of stop at each signpost and read a piece of a children's book as they get exercised down in the Mill River woods. And then... Uh, the kind of the, the upper section of the slide here shows the Bluebird Meadow Interpretive Trail, which we, we teamed up with a local volunteer, Carol Gray. And um, I think there's three of those signs that you can see we installed with the DPW uh, borrowed tool cat auger. And then we teamed up with DCR to uh, get that bigger kiosk on the top right end. And uh, we've had a variety of volunteer help with brush cutting the trails and uh, mowing, and it's actually gone really well. And I'm hoping that uh, some local school groups will actually come and kind of enjoy it. And there's actually a really nice view of the Holyoke Range from one of the slides, uh, or sorry, one of the signs as well. And then on the bottom section is a more recent interpretive trail that we helped uh, install. It was really spearheaded by a volunteer group that Dave hooked up with. Um, they were related to the Fort River Watershed. I forget exactly what the name of their group is, but they were a very energetic group and they did a really nice job with the signs and they put up all of the uh, material on the post that, and uh, kiosk that we installed on either section of the Emily Dickinson Trail. So you can get to that either from uh, Groff Park or from the DCR parking lot off Mill Lane. I think we're ready for the next one. Yeah, so uh, our, our bridge projects, um, kind of our theme going into 2023, and, and we did a fair amount of it in 2022 as well. Um, as many of you know, we, we do have an extensive trail system throughout town, and many of it, uh, many of those trails do have, you know, seasonal wet areas and all the time wet areas that do require require bridging of some sort um so you know the theme to, to to go into the season this year is to kind of maintain and fix replace repair what we already um, have out on our trail systems um, a couple years ago we received a, a grant to do some work on the robert frost trail where new bog bridging was put into place where um you know it, it either needed replacing because it was pretty tired at that point um and permitting was involved to to add such bridging in areas that needed it um so that it, it came out really well for the most part um there's new new construction out on those certain parts of the the robert frost trail 
Um, but there are other sections throughout the Robert Frost Trail and, and other townwide trails as, as well um, that are getting to that little bit of a weathered point. Um, we get, again, just kind of similar to the trees. A lot of trail users report to us, um, you know, a 10 foot section of bog bridging on uh, Trail X is, is snapped in half, making it, you know, somewhat of a hazard to go over. So, um, again, during these, I, I guess we can call them our slower months, um, just uh, ramping up before our busy spring and summer push um, when the weather's nice to, to get this type of work done. We're spending a lot of time going through lists that we have compiled over the last year or two um, that Brad and I have put together um, ourselves from things. We have recon as well as volunteer help too. Um, and, you know, just trail users in general that report to us what needs doing. So um, some of it will require permitting. Some is just standard, you know, just re uh, placing what's broken and uh, making it passable again. I don't know if you have anything else to add on bridging, Brad, but I think that about sums it up. Uh, so, Tyler, yeah, you did sum it up really well. Our, our goal is to maintain what we have and uh, kind of really make a nice trail network in all of our different trails in Amherst. Um, so some of this is upcoming bridge work that ties into that. And uh, the big picture on the left, as some of you probably already know, is the Robert Francis Bridge, which is... Uh, pretty close to State Street near Puffer's Pond. And we're gonna try to get that repainted and um, we're gonna work with Aaron on that as well. I guess we're gonna work with Aaron on all of these projects. <laughs> We've already started. Um, uh, the, some of the other pictures like the uh, small one on the top left is uh, the Brickyard bridging that leads up to the National Guard Bridge. And we're gonna try to make that a little bit easier to pass through, even though it's probably in the uh, uh, more challenging category as far as trails go. And um, same thing in the top right, that's the uh, KC trail that goes between Southeast Street and the rail trail. And as you can see, there's some broken uh, planks on the bog bridging that we're gonna replace. We have a lot of sections like that around town that we are gonna be focusing on this summer. And hopefully we'll be able to focus on a lot of it with the people in the center top photo, which is a lot of our volunteers. This is an example of a uh, volunteer group that Tyler actually had set up with some folks down in Amherst Woods. And it was in conjunction with a uh, program that we're doing with the Kestrel Land Trust, where we're trying to reach out to as many local folks as we can to get more of a, uh, a good, uh, work base going on um, on some of these trails and so far it seems to be working I actually noticed Michelle is one of the people who is uh, I've been speaking with about this and there's that there's I think maybe probably 50 more of them that have uh, that we've been talking to even throughout the winter which is nice because as Tyler noted it's tends to be slower months for hiking but people are still out there and very avid on the trails um, the center photo there is the uh, Larch Hill Boardwalk, which is also going to get some much needed TLC this summer. Um, and the bottom left picture is the Robert Frost Trail that goes between Stony Brook Road and the Echo Hill neighborhood and the uh, landfill. So that's just kind of a snapshot of some of the bridge work that's coming and there will be more soon that there's just a ton of it all over town and we're just doing the best we can to get as much of it taken care of this summer as possible i think we're ready for the next one yeah so beavers are our pesky beaver friends um we've had we had quite a few issues with them damming up certain areas um this bigger photo here on the left is uh we're at the uh, plum, plum Brook Pond Loop. Um, we spent some time over there uh, with the mild fall season we had. They stayed pretty active when they typically wouldn't. Um, so it was, you know, a little bit of a project going up there to to just break the, breach the dam as best as we could. And it was it was kind of uh, getting comical as as soon as we would do it, they'd have it built again. <laughs> so we got our steps walking it back and forth uh, with pitchforks up there to break that up. Um, 
but yeah, just, um, you know, there needs to be that important balance between trail access for our trail users and hikers and, and trail enthusiasts in general, um, you know, in conjunction with how we manage beavers because they are becoming um, problematic throughout town um, on our conservation lands. And as you can see in these photos, um, these are definitely highly used areas where, you know, foot traffic and, and uh, hiker presence um, is is very present. So um, that's definitely a something we deal with every year. And, and uh, it was definitely more so of a, an issue this fall, or I guess later into the season than we typically deal with them. So definitely trying to, um, you know, structure and, and make sure we have that, that good balance of management um, along with, you know, how people are accessing our trail systems. So Puffer's mm -hmm. Pond is a, uh is kind of an overloved conservation area and we are working to uh, make some much needed repairs around there. As you can see in the bottom right is actually a picture I took a while ago, but it, it's been kind of coming up a lot lately where people ask, where are all the trees? And unfortunately due to the storm damage that we've had over the years, we've had to remove some of them. Um, Tyler and I actually spent some, I think close to a week over there a couple of years, maybe three years ago, uh, pruning some of the trees to try to make them healthier and the whole beach safer. But we're also going to be working with Aaron on some cribbing and some beach sand around the pond, as well as on the, uh, the perimeter trail. I think we can go to the next one. Yeah, so here we have some uh, new infrastructure at, at the Fort River Farm. Um, we spent a lot of time down there um installing it or you know making the parking lot um you know new adding trg spreading making the uh, it a nice level parking lot um the split rail as well you can see um that was all new added this year um we, between borrowing actually i think we actually rented an excavator with an auger head to install that particular fencing split rail fencing that is um and moving forward, you know, Fort River Farm has this type of split rail. Um, Podic Conservation Area is another one. As we do these types of new infrastructure projects, um, we really want to, our goal is to shoot for a uniform look in all these areas. And you can note the signage as well. Um, it's a little bit of rebranding, I suppose, from what we typically had before with the wooded, uh, wooden routed signs you see on a lot of trailheads and, and throughout our trail systems. Um, but these types of infrastructure projects and, and what we're doing with the signage, the uniform split rail look, um, the rolling out and spreading and adding of TRG, it just it gives a more welcoming feel, we feel, um, to conservation users, especially down at a community garden such as Fort River. Um, pretty proud of the work we did down there and, and the many hands that, that were involved in it as well. Um, there's a kiosk down there too. Well, I apologize. So the picture is a little hard for me to see, but uh, we installed that kiosk, kiosk as well. Um, very well made product. Um, and just again, moving forward with, with some of these different areas, that's that whole uniform goal is uh, what our goal is trying to achieve and, and just make that overall um, presence known that this is, you know, our ownership as, as a town um, and take pride in these areas. So yeah, here's the one, uh, that next slide that you just had up. Yeah, Podic and Catherine Cole there. So you can see the same similar sp uh, style split rail as Fort River Farm. So, you know, the Fort River Farm's obviously more in the, the south part of town, whereas Podic and Catherine Cole are, are in the north. But regardless of location, um, you can see we're, we're shooting for that uniform look. All right, so over at Amethyst Brook, this is kind of a reminder of the uh, some of the damage that took place. Um, you can see in the top right, we had ice the size of a mattress coming through and a lot of it. And it took out that bridge, which we've since removed and cleaned up. And uh, we are working as a team, uh, Dave and Rob are working on a new design that we can uh, hopefully get installed soon. So um, other than that, uh, Amethyst, we have some bog bridging to do in there, and uh, we've been helping the animal welfare officer with some of the uh, 
dog poop stations while she's out on medical leave. I think that's it. So over, yeah, here's some odds. Uh, oh, go ahead. Over at Sweet Alice, um, we installed a new bridge and some signage along the Pond Loop Trail this summer. And uh, we also, which uh, came in front of you folks for the permitting, we did the uh, dewatering project with the contractor. You can see we, um, we uh, sealed off the dam so that the water would build up against that piece of plywood in the top right. And uh, it, it actually, it ended up working out well. They were able to replace the culvert. And then the final product is the uh, ship lapped lumber um, that we replaced the boards with in the bottom right. So yeah, here, uh, here are some great pics um, that show the, the field and uh, brush mowing, brush hogging, open space manage it management that we try to achieve every year um so as you can see some of these areas um they do grow back pretty heavily with different invasives buckthorn and what have you so it's sort of a it's a constant battle every season to knock a lot of that down and try to regain a lot of that uh that grassland habitat that we're shooting for um but typically every year um we try not to mow until you know it's mid July, July 15th is the date we typically use when the majority of nesting birds and, and pollinators are, are finished doing their thing. Um, but it's, you know, the challenge with that is when one thing's done, something else might uh, be in, in effect. So we, we get some pushback once in a while from different people that see us out and about mowing at certain times of year, um, you know, about why we're there specifically that time of year. But um, you got to do it when you can. Weather uh, be, plays a big factor into it, too. Um, this past season was really dry throughout the summer, so we were able to hit some of our larger areas, such as Atkins Flats. Um, that's one of our, our really big ones that is multiple days on site trying to knock that out with, with the resources we have um, with our two tractors and brush hogs. Same with Westover Meadow um, was another big one, but uh, yeah, we were able to, we are still actually cranking along um, now, um, just being such a mild winter, lack of snow, um, you know, a hard, harder ground now to, to be able to be out there um, to, to get caught up on some of these areas. Um, it's actually, it's, it's been a benefit this year so far um, throughout the fall and into the, even, you know, the early February month um, that we're in here now. Um, so yeah, the, the timing is a big thing when it comes to this open space management and brush hogging stuff. Again, the weather is a, is a effect. Seems like we're losing Tyler a little, Brad. Do you want to jump in? Sure. I, I think he pretty much covered the moon. If you want to skip, uh, you can probably skip this one too because we talked about hickory a lot earlier. And sorry, Brad, I didn't, or um, Tyler, I didn't mean to cut you off, but you um, something happened with your nope. connection. I froze okay. up, yeah. Hickory, <laughs> we're we're good with hickory because we talked about hickory. You I said think so, yeah. Okay. Yeah, everything we've had at hickory has actually been very positive. The folks have been very happy every time we've been out there cleaning up and mowing the trails and making the bridges safer. It's it's actually been kind of nice it's been really busy with the dog walking and people hiking with strollers so we'll move on to signage which has actually been kind of a fun project this year we've done a lot of signage which uh, people also seem to appreciate um, this year we replaced the uh, Kevin flood sign we we kind of worked with the family to uh, who donated the material for the sign and we replaced that sign that had since fallen over. Um, we also, as I mentioned earlier, replaced all of the, or installed new signs over at uh, the Sweet Alice Conservation Area for the uh, Pond Loop Trail. And um, the bottom picture is all of the uh, handicap signs that we've been putting up at the uh, parking lots that Tyler mentioned earlier. And the bottom right picture is kind of a zoomed in uh, picture of the kiosk at Podic. 
Again, everything has been kind of uniform and looking nice. And then the top right picture has been kind of a challenging sign for us. It's been the uh, E. coli management signs, I guess you could call it. So every week we do uh, water sampling at Puffer's Pond and that sign is to alert the public that we've been having a tough time with uh, the E. coli over there. So hopefully that doesn't happen this year, but uh, that gives you kind of a snapshot of some of the signage we've been doing. And we're going to do a lot more this summer with a um, project with the Kestrel Land Trust. They, uh, they got a grant to replace a lot of the Robert Frost Trail signage along the trail. And they are working with a designer and the town. And we're going to hopefully get that up uh, soon. So the next one is kind of upcoming projects. And um, we have been pretty much focusing on new bog bridging, replacing bog bridging, and keeping our parking areas like the trailheads, like the first thing you see when you get to one of our places, nice. So this is kind of an example of some tired uh, parking lots and trailheads and uh, bog bridging. And it just it's stuff that we're going to try to make a little bit nicer this year. And as you can see on the right, it'll be hopefully with the help of a lot of our volunteers. Uh, the only other thing I didn't mention, I guess, is the ADA trails. So um, an example of that would be oh, the Robert Francis Bridge, actually. Leading up to that is the Kevin Flood Trail, which is one of our ADA trails. Um, another good example would be the, the Larch Hill Trail Network. That's uh, another TRG based trail uh, beyond the boardwalk. And I think we have five or six more that we're gonna try to get some new gravel delivered to and get them regraded and kind of back up to snuff again. Um, if you wanna go to the next slide. So our goal is to reach out to a bunch of people around town and we hope that all of you won't be strangers. Uh, we know a lot of you hike well, you can read that, but we're just looking for all of you to reach back out to us and, and we're looking for people to be our eyes and ears out on the trails. We really do appreciate that and it, it works out awesome. Um, so I've included my email address as well as Tyler's and the uh, our phone number and some fun pictures of the uh, Puffers Pond South Beach. We had some deer uh, come through the trail system over there during uh, COVID. And then more recently, we had some bears come through uh, the Arboretum. Um, so I, I guess this is probably the best time if, if anyone has any questions or comments that we can talk about. I know we're running short on time, but. Michelle, you have a question? Yeah, I'll just be real quick. Um, yeah, so I got a list for you, Brad. <laughs> some things I found in North Amherst. But yeah, everybody, when you're on hikes, right, take pictures, write things, some things down. There's a bunch of signs down on um, Walt Whitman and Center Mill. So, but I, I, I got some pictures to show you. Um, I just had a question regarding the ADA trails. So <clears throat> as a mom who once had strollers and small kids, these trails are actually really great for young families, like with toddlers and strollers. Is there a list of these trails like on the website? Because I think that young families would would also enjoy them in addition to the ADA component. They sort of serve those two purposes. Um, but I think it would be a great resource for just like young families and amers. And that's it. That is a really good idea. I'm not sure if we have publicized that well specifically on the website, but yeah, you're right, we should. We are actually on that note working on um, making a nicer, more welcoming um, spot on our website for the trail requests to come in, as well as making it a little bit easier for people to sign up as volunteers. Right now, you kind of have to navigate the website a little bit tough to find it. And it's the, the way uh, I'm working with Angela Mills in the town manager's office, and she's really good with that uh, form that she's been using and it, it's going to be a lot easier for people to get to us with all of that stuff so we can add the ada trail stuff to that 
So Brad, that was going to be my question. So for folks that want to uh, volunteer there, so you have to go through the website to access or make a request or um, what's the best way for folks who want to volunteer? Uh, for people who already know me, they can just ask. <laughs> but for people who don't, yes, the website really is the best. Okay. Way. All right. So there is a forum on the web. That's but I apologize. I haven't uh, looked for it. So um, there is one on the website for folks. It's tough to find. And we're work and that's part of what we're working on. Angela has really been pretty helpful with that. So that is coming really soon. Great. Yep. Great. Fletcher, I know we have to move on. I, I just want to take this opportunity to thank Brad and Tyler and all the volunteers. You know, this was kind of a 2002 summary, you know, leading into and looking forward. You know, 80 miles of trails, a couple thousand acres of land. We have two full time staff. We have Aaron, we have myself, and we have help from the planning department. DPW is, is, is wonderful to work with. They often help us on big trees and, and big challenges. Um, but you know there there are limits to resources and funding. Um, we're we're trying to be more creative where we need to. We will hire private contractors to help us with larger projects, larger bridge bridge projects. Something like the Amethyst Brook Bridge, which we have some funding for, is probably something that we will contract out. Um, that's a big project. Um, you know we want to do it once and for a generation. We do not want to come back. At the next ice storm or the big big um, uh, spring freshet and find that bridge gone. So, thanks to Brad and Tyler for all this great work. We're, we have some CPA funding to spend thanks to the CPA committee and the town council. We have some capital money, so we have a chance. We really have a chance to fix it, uh, fix fix it first, and fix some of the things that need addressing out there. So uh, it's going to be an exciting couple of years to to make our trails even better than they are. Great. Thanks. Hey, thanks, Brad, Tyler. I know you guys have a ton on your plate and there's a lot to do and there's a lot of public watching and um, you guys are doing a great job. We appreciate it. It's a constant, highly used outdoor areas. It's great. Thank you. And people notice, I mean, it's, it's one thing, like, obviously it's really easy to complain. Like that's the easy thing to do, but when there's, but people really do appreciate stuff and see stuff like, you know, not, you don't get that a lot. And so I just, I think um, it's really important to say that, um, you guys are doing a really good job. You are working really hard and, and people do notice that. It's just, you just, you never, you know, I'm not going to call you and say, Hey, great job. But if I have something to say bad and I'll, I'll call you, you know, it's just, so it's just, I just want to reiterate that um, you guys are doing a great job and, and keep it up. It's really noticeable, especially if you go to other towns and, and, and look at their out, outdoor recreation areas and stuff, you know, we're, we're pretty lucky to have you guys out there and you've been an extremely productive um, land manager here, man, 13 Thank years. You. Like good job. Thank you. It really is nice when people tell us that things are bad, though. <laughs> okay. It's very helpful. <laughs> I'll do that. <laughs> okay, but now you got to go. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> <laughs> Great, man. Uh, thanks. And I think maybe we should do, a, um, I was thinking, a Conservation Commission uh, team building uh, volunteer time sometime would probably be a good idea if we could maybe organize that for ourselves and, and um, we'll get you involved. That sounds awesome. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, guys. Thank you. All right. We're, we are moving on. Um, next up, our 7.30. It is uh, 7.53. We got the notice of intent, SWCA, for the 52 Fearing Street. Do we have anyone here for that? Um, so for 52 fairing, it's going to be a continuation. Yep. Um, they're, uh, they've already given me a notice in writing that it's okay, okay to continue. Oh, great. <laughs> Who wants to make a motion? Um, I move to continue the public hearing to March 8th, 2023 at 7.30 p.m. Second. Oh. Great. Cameron with a move. Michelle with a second. Uh, Cameron, can I get an aye? Aye. Michelle? Aye. Andre? Aye. Alex? Thumbs up. I see you. And an aye for Fletcher. Um, great. Aye. <laughs> yeah, I got you. I got you. I got you with a thumbs up. It's all recorded.
Okay, we're going on to the RDA then. Um, this has already been, I don't need to open this, it's already been open. All right. right. Um, and do we have somebody here uh, with, uh, for this application? Yeah, I think Kristen McDonough, I'll pull her yeah. in. Um, I don't know if anybody else is on. Um, uh, Tom, if you want to come Tom's, in, raise I your hand. I can, up. okay, there we go. You raised up. All right. I think that's our folks. Hi, everyone. I'm Kristen McDonough. I'm with SWCA, and I'm here to present the continuation for a request for determination of applicability regarding the relocation of a historic home from 174 Sunset Ave to 175 West Street in Amherst, which is an empty lot. Um, we opened the hearing on January 25th, and we also had a site walk with the agent earlier that day where we added just a couple additional wetland flags. So when I met with you on January 25th, we continued to wait for the engineers to update the site plans, which would reflect those additional flags and then the adjusted buffer zone. Um, I can pull up the revised plans if that's okay. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, so this is the site plan. Um, and then this sheet, the second sheet is the, sorry, I can't see below your photos. I think this is the grading, the erosion control and grading plan. Um, so on the first sheet, uh, what we show is this additional flagged area, which it looks like it coincides with a little bit of a drainage swale. Um, we revised the estimated buffer zone impacts. So the original proposal was to relocate a historic house within an existing lawn of the vacant lot within the, um, within the buffer zone, uh, but outside, I think it was the 50 foot. But with this little addition, we're now inside the 50 foot. So we show that on the second page. So we added a couple high bush blueberry shrubs uh, as mitigation. Um, we estimated the revised proposed impacts within the on site buffer zone as 12%. Uh, so that is below the town bylaw threshold of 20%. Um, this includes all temporary and permanent impacts. So, including site preparation and grading, as well as just this little bit of the detached garage and the deck and a little bit of the driveway. Um, just to go down to this grading plan. Let me zoom Kristen, in. can I ask you a clarifying question um, sure. just on what you just said? Mm -hmm. The buffer zone impacts is the entire buffer zone within 100 feet. Yes, the entire limit of work and the entire on-site buffer zone. It is 12%. Okay, okay perfect. Mm -hmm. Just clarifying that. Thank you. And then we also had the engineers add these call-outs to the distance to the, to the wetland line uh, because that changed. So even though originally we were hoping to stay outside of the 50 foot with that addition of the wetland flags, we're now inside the 50 foot um, for the limit of work. Uh, but again, limit of work includes temporary site work. Um, we added these high bush blueberries in order to add diversity and vegetative structure to the buffer zone, which includes a lot of non-native species. Unfortunately, these plants don't show the, um, the ortho photo in the background. I've got this, which isn't great, but I can pull it up. This is just a screenshot from my ArcGIS online with their CAD plans. This just shows this yellow line here is the limit of work. And this just kind of reinforces that the entire limit of work is within the existing lawn. This is the where the shrubby area over here, and then this wetland down here is forested. Um, Aaron can maybe pull up photos, and I have additional photos if we want to see what this buffer zone looks like. But there are a lot of invasive species in here, and those high bush blueberries are proposed right at the toe of the um, the driveway slope here. So it was sort of a double um, double intent here: one to add a little bit of vegetative diversity and structure to this very heavily invaded, um, non-native kind of shrubby area over here, but also maybe to consider any potential sheet flow coming off of this driveway before it enters the buffer zone. Um, I'll just pull this up. 
again, in case any commissioners have any questions, um, but we're hoping the commission would consider a negative determination for the relocation of this historic home to the vacant lot. Kristen, I actually, for some reason, um, I think my photos didn't make it um, oh. into the uh, the project folder. Do you have photos to share? I sure do. Unfortunately, photos always load very slowly for me. Um, so I have some from our site walk. Um, okay. I'm going to try to find down. mine as well while we're, I, I know they're in here. I just am trying to track them down. Why don't you figure uh, that, um, look for those. Um, Aaron, you were out there with, when they adjusted the um, wetland boundary? Yes. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> just so that the commission knows, there is an area of the um, the property that's not lawn. And, and I think Kristen's photos show it well here. Um, it's kind of like a shrubby area. That area was a little soggy. And we did check um, the soils in that area and they didn't come up as hydric. Um, I, I did ask to check that area pretty, I checked it pretty extensively mostly. I just wanted to make sure that that wasn't um, coming up as wet and it, it seems to have um, upland soils. We were there at kind of a, a tricky time of year because the ground was frozen and the water table's high. Um, I did see some evidence of hydrology um, coming in sort of the footprint, but I think it's it was surface water runoff coming from the slope because it's a very steep um, lot coming from the roadway down um, to the back of the lot. I can walk you through. So this is a limit of work stake. And then maybe you can see there's a pink flag over here. That was one of, I think our new wetland flag, our revised wetland flags. And here's another one that ties in. So this is kind of that drained swale right here. There's one, there's two, there's three, and there's four. So those four wetland flags are all new. And then that ties into, let me just pull this up really quick. So that's this one, this one, this one, and this one. And then that ties into the old wetland flag, which was right there. And there's actually an upland berm right here, which we just lumped in with the wetland delineation because it won't matter. Um, so going back to my photos, so that is looking west towards the wetland line. The wetland is pretty much, there's a very clear topographic break down here. Um, this is that shrubby area. There's a lot of um, glossy buckthorn and multiflora rose, a little bit of bittersweet. Um, can I scroll through photos with this? Darn it. Um, let me move it over here. Try this. Here we go. Uh, this is looking north, I think. Again, these are limit of work stakes. Um, that's a wetland flag, maybe. No, wait, maybe this is south. I think Sorry. that is looking north. And, it and is you looking can, north. You yeah, can okay. see, you can see oh, right yeah, there's those in flags. front of the in front of that middle stake, you can see there was like a little pocket of water there. We we took a core there to check it because it was um, you know, there was like standing water there. So I, we checked it and it was not hydric. Yeah, so that's else. the plug actually. Thank you, Aaron. Yeah. And then these are those two, um, flags that match up with that corner right there. So yeah, thank you, Aaron. Sorry. I can't scroll through without sliding my photos over because they're, uh, let's see. And then this is also looking North um this is going to be the toe of the driveway here from what from what it looks like on the plans um so there is again just to pull up the plans some uh riprap armored stone right here and so this is that area uh that coincides with that photo oh, come on right here and so then the high bush blueberries are proposed to be just over here to the left. Let's see. Uh, and then this is facing towards 116. So this kind of shows the grade. This is pretty much where the driveway is proposed, right over here. Um, again, just to remind the commission, there are a couple of mature trees on site, but the contractors and the applicant propose no mature trees need to be removed, they can go around them. Um, then I have some from earlier in the year. This is 
facing south from 116. This is again the curb cut where the driveway will come in. This tree is proposed to remain. Um, I hope I'm not making you all dizzy, this back and forth. Uh, again, this is a big tree that's proposed to be remaining. Maybe if I make you guys, oh, here we go. Okay. Another one, this is facing north. Again, the driveway would come down here. So this is a good photo that shows the topography. This existing lawn area is where the historic house would be relocated to. Um, just another photo facing north with the buffer zone over here and the wetland off camera. Uh, here's another photo of the buffer zone. I'm not sure if that's still loading or if it's just blurry. Okay, so here's another photo of the buffer zone with the wetland in the distance. Um, we did take a couple of field reference data points of the perennial stream, which I think is the Fort River, and it is, um, we are well outside of riverfront, so we know that we are not in bordering land subject to flooding or riverfront area. Um, I could keep going. I have a lot of photos, so I don't want to take up too much time, but I am happy to continue to scroll. Here's another one facing north. This Probably pretty much shows one. the work area, the buffer zone. Okay. That's been uh, very helpful. Thank you. Um, Michelle, do you have a question you want to um, hop on here? We, sorry, yes, go ahead. Yeah, okay, so 12% still within our discretionary allowances, right? So it's over 20 where we would require mitigation. So I just want to ask about what you're doing and I'm glad the, the vaccinium's going in there. You said a couple, but it, it, is that the actual number that's going in there, what I see on the plans? Yes, okay. we, we proposed 15, but um, again, we're open to discussion. If you prefer, you know, uh, a cornice, maybe cornice momum, we're happy with that, or, or a drier cornice that would be better in the buffer zone, we're okay with that. We suggested vaccinium because it has, um, you know, bird habitat value, but so does cornice. So yeah. we're happy. <clears throat> vaccinium is good. I guess my concern is whether or not the homeowners are going to know that that is a mitigation effort. They're going to see it and they're small and they're going to pull it out and start landscaping. So I guess what are the... <clears throat> things in place to ensure that that doesn't just turn into a burning bush hedge or something. Right. Um, we did talk about that. And um, I'm not sure if Tom's also in the audience and you want to chime in on behalf of the landowners, but we did discuss that. Um, we did discuss, you know, maintaining the existing lawn area as existing lawn and considering some sort of benchmarks to maintain a no mow area within the buffer zone. Yeah, I'm here, Kristen, thanks. I mean, whatever the commission wants, really. I think we're pretty flexible on this one. Um, you want bird boxes, we can put up bird boxes. You want boulders, we can roll boulders down there. I don't know uh, how rocky this, I mean, obviously we like to get the boulders from the site if we can, instead of importing them from somewhere else. If we have them, we can use them. Otherwise, we can do bird boxes or or something else, right? Um, you know, really, I'm, we're, we're open to whatever the commission is suggesting here. I'll just open up for the commissioners before we go to public on this, because um, any commissioners have anything right off the top of the head they want to bring up? Aaron, you want to say something? It looks like you're ready to say something. Um, well, I was just going to say that if if we are going to require um, boulders or demarcation, we typically require that sort of like along the 50 foot buffer. Um, but in this case, because the um, uh, limit of work line is extending down into that area that um, we might want to sort of give an indicator, like for example, would the boulders be placed at the limit of work in this instance? Um, if the commission's considering um, allowing the project to go a little bit closer than ordinarily would be. Um, so like, just to make sure we have language that 
is that specifies where those boulders or demarcation should be placed. Right. That's a good point. So beyond the, um, I know you just showed me all those pictures. So beyond that limit of work, there's probably there's like a 25 foot gap of like mow of lawn right now, right? Kind of. Yeah, I know. I know it changes with the. Yeah, it's not con it's not consistent. I don't think. Um, no. Okay. Like the, I, I just the, wanted to confirm. I, I, I appreciate what you this point you're making. Um, it looked like meadow. I mean, not really. Yeah. There's a little bit of ah. the um, development encroaches onto that little meadow there, um, but oh, there sorry. is a portion okay. of lawn that I think is not getting disturbed with the okay. development. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I think I think it's maybe so the the toe of the slope is kind of to the right of that photo where that where that riprap would go at the toe of the driveway. Mm -hmm. And then this is the limit of work. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> go ahead, uh, Michelle. I mean, I, I just would propose boulders of the limit of work unless, you know, if, if I'll start the discussion like that, but um, I would feel comfortable with that. Thank you. Cool. Commissioner, is there anything else you wanna kind of chime in on here? Um, there, um, I'll, oh, I'll jump in ahead. a little just to make it um, to kind of move things a little bit quicker. Um, I did um, come up with some um, uh, requested um, uh, conditions for a potential um, determination and I drafted the determination to basically be in the format of an order of conditions. So there'd be conditions under the Wetland Protection Act and conditions under the local bylaw and they would include the general um, boilerplate that we include for orders of conditions for, you know, monitoring mm -hmm. the site um, and just, you know, our standard boilerplate, but then some additional conditions um, for, um, and I'll, I'll click to the side so you guys can see it, but I did ask Tom earlier today, because as I was looking at this plan, one of the things that had occurred to me was the slope um, and the driveway, and um, is the driveway proposed to be uh, paved? Yes, okay. yes. And so the question that I had asked Tom was about putting a little strip of um, like stone along the edge of the driveway just to infiltrate the runoff coming off the driveway. And I know Tom was hoping to check with um, the engineer to see if that would be okay. Yeah, and that's and that, I talked to Barry and then Phil Henry, the engineer. They both thought it was fine, so we're okay. we're fine with with what you suggested, Aaron. Okay, awesome. Um, so I was just hoping that we could condition that in to do like um, I I'm not. Uh, picky necessarily about the width, like one to two feet of um, uh, of crushed stone um, on one or both sides of the driveway, depending on what the commission feels is appropriate. Um, and then like maybe four inches deep, just to add a little bit of infiltration along that driveway because of the steep slopes. Um, and then I added permanent demarcation of the no mow at the limit of um, limit of work to be, you know, um, you could do like a split rail, or boulders or whatever you think is like um, attractive or whatever, just to be maintained um, in perpetuity. And then, I'm sorry, I'm losing my voice a little bit. So if I, I cut out here, I'll try my best, but standard boilerplate, um, native plantings only, uh, snow st no snow storage and resource areas. Um, let's see, contractors should be provided with the order of conditions. Um, environmental controls have to be maintained by the contractor. Um, do, 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 do. Uh, that one was actually, thing. some of these were boilerplate, so I apologize if there's duplicates. I was rushing sort of towards the end of the day today. Um, <clears throat> uh, environmental monitor and, um, you know, really what you guys feel necessary, like weekly inspections or monthly inspections to check on erosion controls. Um, Pre-construction meeting is pretty standard for all of our um, projects. Mm -hmm. And then um, erosion control inspection reports I usually ask for on a, um, a monthly basis. It kind of depends on the site, but really what, whatever you guys are comfortable with. Um, but I'm I'm personally fine with this being permitted as a, um, a determination so long as the applicant knows that it's going to be uh, have to be completed within three years, the work. Um, before I get to Alex, is that something that uh, you see comfortable three years of work, um, Tom? Yeah, I'm hoping, I think we're hoping to be done in 
six months of work. So, Excellent. okay. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. There's no uh, problem here. Okay. Uh, Alex, do you have a question? No, I don't have a question. I, I just want to turn my video on. Can't get it to turn off. Anyways, I wanted to support Michelle and, um, and looking for some permanent demarcation. I, I, I think it would be appropriate to have the demarcation as permanent mm -hmm. as what's being constructed. So boulders? Boulders, like something boulder like that, idea. because houses get sold, new people move in, things get, get forgotten. And um, so something where she's got permanent down there that she's typing yeah. now, but something- What's this say boulders? Uh, something as, as permanent as what's going on. Yeah, I agree. I think that's a good idea. Um, if, if Tom, right, what boulders, um, the driveway, two feet of crushed stone, probably a little bit more than four inches would probably be better, six inches at least, something, whatever that grit, whatever you're cutting down, that the asphalt and the base layer is going to be, get down to that same level. So what's that, six or eight inches maybe? Yeah, I think so. Just something that does infiltrate a little bit more because I, I don't, yeah. So you, you see where we're trying to get at here with yep. that. And obviously we're going to catch, it's going to catch it. Thanks Fletcher. Of, you're welcome and catch it at the, um, the riprap at the bottom of the driveway. Um, any other commissioners? And then I'm going to bring it to the public real quick. All set. Uh, does anybody in the public have any questions about this project? If you do raise your hand. Um, this is pretty, we got, um, we do have a participant raise their hand. Um, when you get on, could you please just uh, say your name and um, where you live? And do you have that permission there? Is that up to me? Oh, there she is. Yep. Here we go. Just got to unmute yourself, Dorothy. There you yes. go. Um, okay. This is really just a comment um, in demarcation. I, I would much prefer split rail because I think it's more in keeping with the wood house and woods and fields than boulders. Um, where I used to live in Norfolk, there was a huge field in back of my house and along the road, it had split rail and it just, the, the looking at field and meadow through split rail and woods is very nice. Um, boulders are kind of like, I don't know, I don't think they fit the look of that historic house. That's just my comment. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks, Dorothy. Appreciate it. We're just looking for a permanent demarcation. So that's where we're kind of, we're, that's, we're trying to <laughs> split that difference there no pun intended um uh, michelle do you have a comment on that yeah i mean i agree about the aesthetics comment i just split rail fence rots and it needs to be replaced and that becomes the onus of the landowner and maybe they don't want to do it or it starts looking worse than it started so ultimately i i think i'd like to stick with something permanent like boulders and that, that's yeah and boulders we're not obviously tom we're not talking um 10 foot tall boulders we're talking about something you know you know we probably don't yeah, yeah. need uh, yeah. basketball court size boulders but obviously <laughs> something big enough that's demarcated and that also, also when the grasses grow that when they go over that boulder it's going to be I think snell over at the corner of snell and baker street we had done mm. uh some boulders over there Aaron. i think that was a that was some demarcating boulders so right by behind you drive south i think those are boulders that are demarcating over there yeah Good we old, use yeah, we use boulders quite a bit. I mean, the only thing about boulders, and again, it's this isn't going to have an order of conditions tied to it, so it's not going to be recorded on the deed. We're not going to have ongoing conditions for it. The only thing about boulders is people can go around boulders with a lawnmower if they so choose to. So a uh, fencing is a barrier that people can't go in between or, you know, around. Uh, oh, just, oh. I mean, it's it's they're both they're. Uh, costs and benefits to both so just to keep those things in mind we could do we could say boulders or split rail in the order we don't have to nail it down right now let the applicant decide what they think you know would work the best uh, on the we, site I, I think we need to be a little bit more directive aggressive the, right i mean we want permanent demarcation let's get permanent demarcation i appreciate okay it. I do like a split rail fence myself, but it's true. They do just rot and fall down. And then next thing you know, there's a lawn and a okay. floor in the back. Okay. Fair enough. Uh, Alex, you have something else to say? Yeah. Um, 
I hear the aesthetic question and I just want to ask, is a stone wall out of question? It's permanent, it's rock, and it's more attractive. And very expensive. <laughs> I think I think that's going to be the rub on, on our side with all due respect. And you got to excavate. You got to dig out and put a base layer on yeah. and, and you got to make that thing. To do it right. Yeah. Yeah, agreed. do it right. That's a lot. That's a ton. Probably a small fraction of the total project. I think it's some type of permanent demarcation. If the landowner ever decides it want, wants to put in a stone wall, I think we'll be totally open for that. But at, at this moment, I don't think we can force them to. I just I just was hearing the aesthetic comment that uh, Dorothy Pam made, and I fully understand it. And I'm with I like I like fences too. Uh, so just thought I'd ask. Copy. And then we got the blueberries going up as well. If there's anything else that maybe should we put some flowering dogwood or something to help for the aesthetic? I think the applicant can be creative in that as well. Um, just throwing that out there as well. You know, we are leaving the big tree. We uh, the big trees are staying, which is nice. So we appreciate that step being taken. I do notice that beach every time I drive by. Um, so with that, if there's anything else? Is um, are we comfortable? Somebody comfortable doing a motion? Um, so just before you guys jump in with a motion, I just want to make it clear if you're going to just say with um, uh, the noted conditions that the noted conditions that are listed include the crushed stone, the permanent demarcation of the no mo at the limit of work, and then the conditions that were um, that I that I ran through at the beginning. I will also point out that Heritage did respond on um, January 26th. I think I forwarded that letter to the commission and they responded that there will be no adverse impact to the actual resource area of state protected rare wildlife, but we are anticipating a turtle protection plan if work occurs during the wood turtle active season, which we're not entirely sure we will need. Um, if it's basically after April, we're going to right. prepare and implement a turtle protection plan. Right. Tom just said six months. Knock this thing out. So uh, uh, that's a great point, Kristen. Thank you for reminding me of that. And so that might it might be good to just have a condition that um, condition that uh, NHESP conditions be followed. All right, we're gonna need a motion. I'll do it. Maybe someone could, Aaron, make sure I'm doing it correctly. You don't have to list all the conditions. We've already okay. sorted that out. You can just you can just read this section. Okay, motion. I move to issue a positive determination checking box five bylaw negative okay. determination checking box three WPA with noted additional conditions for one seventy five West Street. Second. Andre the second. <clears throat> Or just Andre seconded. You're not the second. Are you in a second? I don't know. All right. Um, voice vote. Andre. Aye. Michelle. Aye. Alex. Aye. Cameron. Aye. And I for Fletcher. Hey, thank you, you two. Thanks a lot. Good seeing thank you. Thank you. We're very interested to see the house come down downtown. Um, Amber. <laughs> Get your popcorn ready. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Have a good night. See ya. Okay. Um, we're going to move on to the notice of intent or 740 notice of intent. Um, move to close. Okay. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to stop sharing so I can check the attendees. It's a little hard to flip back and forth because yep, I can't yep, see good. attendees. Um, and I don't see if, um, if, uh, it might be the 508 number is um, Glenn. He mentioned that he might have to join by phone. Uh, yep. Is so anybody here from uh, EBT Environmental Consultants on behalf of Amhad? Is it, how do you say Amhad? Amhad. Amhad. <laughs> it's Amherst Hadley. <laughs> oh, gotcha. Yeah. We discussed that last time. Unless Dorothy, you want to take it away? <laughs>
uh, um, so I do you want me to add the number it's a 508 number so I'm fairly confident it's yeah, sure. uh it's Glenn um yeah. now Glenn is handling multiple hearings tonight so um yes just he he might be kind of doing triage uh in multiple hearings at once so but before I bring him in I'll just say I've reviewed the material uh, the um we all we were waiting for was some detail on the replication area because um there was some indications that the replication area wasn't built to spec on the original permit. So um, Glenn provided that to me. I'm I'm satisfied with the information that's been provided that we can issue an order of conditions tonight. Um, I think that the the one thing that the commission needs to specify in the order of conditions um, when we're ready to go there is um, so there's currently an old order of conditions that had permitted the replication area. So the replication area was designed and originally constructed constructed as part of the original um, 23 green leaves development. Um, it was constructed, but it wasn't constructed exactly to the specs of the plan, which it should have been larger and it also shouldn't have been so deep. Um, it's actually just like looks like a little sort of pond right now or a vernal pool. And there's a strip of upland in between that area and the wetland. It was supposed to be connected to the wetland and it was supposed to be a little more shallow to actually provide additional BBW habitat. Um, so what I'm getting at is that um, there's no certificate of compliance that's been issued for the green leaves yeah. original subdivision that that um, that order of conditions is still hanging there. Ordinarily, DEP doesn't like to have multiple orders of conditions open on a given property. <laughs> and so the commission should consider if if what we're saying is um, the the order that we're issuing hopefully tonight is uh, going to um, basically kind of take over the um, uh, replication area in terms of governing it, how we want to handle the certificate of compliance. So for example, do we want to say, okay, once the, it's constructed, we can issue a certificate of compliance on the original. Do we want to close out and have them submit a request for certificate of compliance now and reference the new order of conditions in it, something like that, so that they're tied together somehow? Um, the other thing that we could do is wait to issue a certificate of compliance on the original until it's completed and has been monitored. So those are all options that the, the board could consider, um, but we should address it in some form or fashion that the two are connected. Um, and I will try. Can we, can we, can we combine, can we just combine them? I mean, no, the permits the expired and um, it, yeah, it's long expired. So like if it was, if it was an amendment, we could tie them together. Um, my recommendation would be either like what, what you're comfortable with is to say to the applicant, submit a request for certificate of compliance and we issue a partial and note in that partial certificate that the replication area was constructed um, not to spec and that the new order of conditions and reference the file number will be handling the replication area so henceforth um, something to that effect this would be an option conditions. yeah um, so something to think about how you guys would feel comfortable dealing with that but I think the the main objective here is to make sure that it's clear that the um, replication area must be completed and monitored um, well, that's understandable but that's a little tricky uh, Michelle you have something you want to chime in on I was just curious, what's what would be the timeline of the henceforth um, condition permit? Is it another three years or is there a shorter timeline on it for the complete like fixing it basically? Well, so in the new order of conditions, um, typically they're monitored for three years. So when you do a replication area, it would be constructed and then we would require monitoring for three years once it's constructed and we would require those monitoring reports for the life of the permit. The idea being that like in the course of a three year period, if like 50% of the trees died, um, that they would, you know, we they would have to be replaced. all for streamlining um and we don't have a request for certificate of compliance before the board tonight right. but i i think that this is just an important like if we, we issue tonight anyway we we can issue and we can close it and say we're issuing the order of conditions 
but we should give the applicant some guidance um, with regard to how we want them to handle the request for certificate of compliance. Should they just wait until the other permits closed out or do we want them to close it out beforehand just so that there's not two orders hanging there? I'm just worried about us getting caught somehow, uh, you know, like caught up in something, but it doesn't seem, I don't, you know what I mean? Like, I don't want to get. Well, it, it this happens like a lot. Fixing it, I get it. Yeah. Right, um, commissioners, you got anything else to say? I mean, I, I think that last option was we, if we're okay with moving forward and putting this condition and then asking them to come back with the partial certificate of compliance, it doesn't seem like the applicant's on either. So we don't, can't, couldn't get it. Go ahead, Andre. So just to make sure what's happened, what's happened is that we have the old uh, permit with uh, some conditions that were not entirely met. And then we have a, uh, a new per permit that's, uh, uh, that they're looking, uh, yeah, that they're looking to, uh, to get or, or Right, that's for the yeah. water line. It's for a water line water connection line. between the buildings. Okay, yeah, and uh, and so I, I guess in my mind, they're two separate things. Uh, wouldn't we want them to tie up the first, to wrap up the first one and not mix them uh, or uh, what would be the benefit of- uh, uh, That would be the ideal, but the first so. permit expired. So it's no longer valid. They can't do the work under the original permit. Um, that's why the second permit, they can they can combine it into that permit. And that's what they've asked to do to make it so that it's done right. Mm -hmm. And what would be the negative repercussions of, uh, of doing that then? There really is none um, other wow. than like, so for example, the only negative repercussion could be if they didn't construct it at all and we issue a certificate of compliance and it never gets constructed and then the new certificate just hangs out there and they never finish it or monitor it. Um, so that's why, like I have the monitoring reports as a condition on the certificate of compliance. The certificate of compliance are on the uh, order of conditions. The order of conditions is recorded. So it's an encumbrance on the deed. Um, so it's it's really hard for them to do anything going forward with that hanging there. Um, they're going to want to resolve it, but it's really the old the old order of conditions kind mm -hmm. of that's just sitting there. But there's nothing that can be done under it because it's not a valid permit anymore. I'm sorry, I've got a terrible cold. I'm doing a bad job explaining. This. No, you're, it's fine. I think I think we should um, well, let's let that marinate a bit because we still have to talk about the um, the, the current application. Yeah, so the um, Glenn did present it at the last meeting, but right. um, uh, if if you guys want to um, to revisit it at all, what I I just am trying to avoid having Glenn come on and then have him have to step away or something for another hearing. If we can talk okay. about some of this stuff before he comes on. Um, <clears throat> so it these pretty straightforward from last time. And sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so these are kind of like sort of the standard boilerplate that I have been including on all of our permits, like in the last round that we issued last meeting, um, the local and state um, or, uh, boilerplate conditions, only native plantings, no snow storage and resource areas, contractor um, must be provided the order of conditions and sign that they've read it. Um, they have to maintain the um, erosion controls. If they don't, they're subject to enforcement. Um, drainage must be installed using survey to make sure that inverts are properly placed. Um, permanent boundary markers uh, at the wetland rest restoration area. Um, As-built plans must include the mitigation area. Signage at visible inter intervals along the mitigation area indicating that it's a wetland area, no mowing, dumping, cutting. Um, I don't want to run through all of these. Yeah. You can read them yourself, but we this is sort of the standard that we included on the last round. And then it also includes site monitoring, um, uh, the erosion in, in 
erosion control inspections to be submitted on a monthly basis, but erosion control, the inspections have to be done weekly, the uh, monitoring reports submitted monthly, and then quarterly reports on the um, wetland mitigation area, um, which must begin within six months of construction, and they have to um, be done quarterly until the um, construction is completed on the mitigation area, at which point we get a final report, and that final report is fine, is part of the request for certificate of compliance. Okay. I mean, I don't have, yeah, I don't have any issues with this part. Uh, commissioners, do you have any anything with this particular part? <laughs> okay. Um, is there, did we ask the public last time about this? I forget. Um, um, we did. There was one public comment, but there's definitely no harm in asking yeah, again. Is there anybody in the, in the public um, concerned or have any questions about this project for the um, water line replacement at uh, Green Leaves? Um, you can chime in. Yeah, Ed, you can come on in and just um, say who you are and where you live. That'd be great. We've got two participants. Do you want to go one at a time or? Yeah. Okay. Yep. So I just brought Ed in. It might just take a second for it to catch up. Yep. If you go ahead, yep. Just gotta unmute and you'll be all set. Uh, yeah, I'm um, I'm Ed Perkins and I'm a I'm a resident uh, of the Green Leaves Project. And this project has been going on for almost two decades, uh, as you probably know, um, to get these buildings built. And I was wondering if there's a way to include a um, a timeline for the work to be completed under your purview. Yep. Um, it's the permit's three years, is that correct? So the permit is uh, good for three years. But is there a deadline by which the work uh, needs to be completed included, or is that not under your purview? For example, the work must be completed in six months, the work must be completed right. in 12 months, anything like that. Right. I don't believe so, because because we're actually dealing with the last, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Aaron, because we're just, we're actually gonna talk about the order of compliance for, uh, from the last one. Well, so I think what he's getting at is the construction window, and it's yep. difficult for us to say like how long it's actually going to take okay. for them to do the um, okay. to do the work and complete the work. Um, gotcha. um, we could certainly say something like we encourage the applicant to you know be expeditious with how they complete the work so that the site's not open for a long period of time. And I think that's that would actually be really a good condition because. A portion of the work does go temporary with there's temporary disturbance in a bvw for yeah. the water line right. to be installed so they're excavating in the wetland to install the water line and then returning mm -hmm. it back to its um previous condition putting all the soils back and and stabilizing it um so i do think that we and and that's part of the whole monitoring right because right. there's weekly exactly weekly right. monitoring gun done during construction mm -hmm. Um, and so it keeps their budgeted costs down to require that. So they're, it, it's in their interest to move quickly and get it completed so they don't have a monitor out there every week and do reports every month. And then I think that's an excellent up. idea. Yeah. Um, Great. Okay. Thanks, Ed. Yeah, well, yeah, we'll be watching. We've got uh, anyone else? We had a couple hands up earlier. You're muted, Aaron. I'm muted. I've just promoted Sue to uh, Susan Cummings to okay. panelists so she could speak. You just unmute yourself, Susan, and we'll, you can speak. Hi. Can you hear me? Yep. Oh, okay. Um, so as I understand this, uh, you could approve tonight so that they could start construction you know, as soon as they wanted to, is that correct? Is if you approve tonight? Um, you're muted again, Aaron. Aaron, you're muted. The permit has to be issued first. So the commission, the first step is the commission approves, then the permit is issued. Once the permit is issued, there's a 10 day appeal period. Um, during the 10 day appeal period, 
like aggrieved abutters if there were any could appeal the permit. Um, and then after that 10 day appeal period lapses, they're free to begin working. Okay, so if all goes well tonight, you, when would you issue the permit? It really depends. Um, like the, the last round took me um, 21 days to issue uh, just because okay. we are so backed up. Um, okay. We have had a lot of permits being issued recently. So there's, it takes almost a full day to issue a permit like this. Um, it's, it's a pretty administratively um, intense process. Um, so yeah, we, the goal would be as soon as possible. And my hope would be in the next two weeks, it would be issued. Okay. So I wanted to ask you, I know this isn't in your bailiwick exactly, but do you know, uh, because you're in government there, um, I think they, they, to get the certificate of occupancy in building 28, they need this uh, conservation commission uh, approval. Well, well, they, they, yeah, I, okay, I, no, I'm, I'm just trying to understand the process. Um, say you issue the permit, and I think for the certificate of occupancy, for them to start doing certain things in the building, they need the water. They need the water supply, I think. Is that what your understanding is? Well, we're understand? not really we're, we we're not know. really we're not really concerned with what's going on in the building. Yeah, we don't have any wetlands. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I know I know that. I just so wondered they if wanna, you... they need to get into the wetland. And so we're 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 working with them. Oh, I, I know. I, I knew that. So I just wondered if you knew the process. Yeah, yeah, okay. All right. That's okay. I can find it. I'll yeah. find it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right, thank you, Susan. Is there anyone else? Okay, um, we don't have anyone else. Michelle, um, what would you like to, what do you have? I was just wondering, is this older permit, was it, there wasn't really an issue with like delinquency. It was more that the, the design implementation didn't, wasn't correct. And so it didn't work. So I'm just delinquency. weighing risks here with how we bundle this permit. Um, is that true though? I mean, it wasn't, we're not watching out for them getting the work done. It was just them to fix what was not done right in the first place. So they this permit was issued in the early 2000s. Um, and uh, <clears throat> I don't... I I don't know exactly like was the permit recorded on the order of condition uh, on the deed I don't know. Um, all I know is the order of conditions was issued approving the work they did the work um, and they just kind of move forward they never got a certificate of compliance on it. So. Um, I think that the biggest risk or the, the least risk involved would be just to issue the order of conditions and and say we're not going to issue a certificate of compliance until this work is done and has been uh, uh, monitored for three years. And then at that point, we would consider issuing a certificate of compliance. So that would be the safest route to go if you were worried about it, which is completely fine. That seems pretty straightforward as long as we're able to say that and... I feel pretty comfortable with that. Commissioners, what do you think? Yeah, okay. I mean, I appreciate you bringing that up and um, it's, it's an important piece. We just wanna, you know, as we like to keep all our ducks in a row here. Um, okay, if there's any, nothing else with this permit, I, I think if commissioners, um, maybe we'll get a motion and then off and make sure we state that, um, the other certificate of compliance won't happen until we get this completed after three years. Is that pretty straight? Is that straightforward enough? Yes, and I um, I did yeah, add okay. in those additional conditions here just to show for the record what the conditions would be on the on the order. The commission encourages the applicant to be expeditious with construction to reduce impacts to wetlands and stabilize the site. And then project must be monitored for three years before the commission will consider um, Oops, a certificate of compliance, sorry. Uh, yeah, that's very important, okay. Certificate of compliance on um, original order of conditions. This is the one we can see, you can see this from the, um, from the bike path, right? Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. 
do you guys want to go straight to a motion or do you want to pull um glenn in i know we're running kind of late here so it's up to you guys He's okay i think we, i would be happy to do a motion anyone else in, 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 okay i'm just going to pull the motion back up then so you can see it because i can't see the attendees while it's open yeah you're okay. i can see it right now i move to close the public hearing and issue uh, an order of conditions for 23 and 28 Green Leaves Drive uh, with noted conditions. Second it. Nice job. So we got Andre motion, Cameron second. Uh, voice vote, Cameron. Aye. Andre. Aye. Michelle. Aye. Alex. Aye. And aye for Fletcher. Nice job, team. Thank you, Susan and Ed. Good luck. Keep your eyes out on it. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm just going to stop sharing for a second because I know I saw Virginia on. Virginia's um, with BSC Group and she's representing Eversource and um, and Star. Yep. Moving her to panelist. The people are dropping off. So I just want to make sure she gets in and before I share again. Doing great, Aaron. Keep it up. <laughs> Limping along here. <laughs> you are you are getting a little hoarser and hoarser as you <laughs> as you are a trooper. Hey there, Virginia. Hello. Hey, just got uh, just a quick 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 overview and um where you were at. Yeah. Um so I'm here on behalf of Eversource for the 797 Southeast Street underground cable replacement and junction box installation project. Mm -hmm. So basically at the residence of 797 East Street, there's underground cable that's been there. It's about 40 years old. There's an existing transformer there. And due to multiple cable faults where the residents often loses power, they really need to upgrade and replace this line. Um, and they've decided that adding underground conduit in PVC up through the driveway to the transformer is the thing to do. <laughs> they don't want to install poles there or anything. Um, the, the driveway bisects a uh, large wetland on both sides of the um, on both sides of it. Yeah, clearly it was built a while ago. <laughs> so um, everything within um, the project, almost everything within the project limits can be considered exempt utility maintenance because it's replacement of the existing line right next to, uh, is re replacement with the conduit right next to the existing line. The transformer is also going to be re replaced in that. However, midway up the driveway, they do need to install a new junction box because the driveway is about a thousand feet and it's too long to pull all that conduit and all that um, cable up on, on its own. So um, do you want to share a map? Yes, <laughs> we love maps. We like pictures. I've got maps. A thousand foot, this is a thousand foot driveway? Uh, yeah, I think that's about a thousand foot driveway. It goes all the way back. You wouldn't even know there's a house back there. Wow. So it's kind of like hidden. Um, oh, I don't have the pointer. Okay, so... <clears throat> Um, this is Southeast Street that you can see on the right side of the screen there. They're going to trench up the first half of this driveway to about the fence line. And you can see that there's an HDD mark there. So they're going to use horizontal directional drilling for the rest of the driveway to try to pull that up. Um, as you can see down, we have this purple mark and a yellow little yellow mark on the map. I'm pointing at my map like you guys can see it. Right. Bad habit I have. <laughs> Anyways, so within this area, we're going to, um, they're proposing to install the junction box, which is an 18 by 36 inch green box that you would probably see on along other people's driveways and stuff like that. To do this, they have to put a Two, about a two foot by three foot trench in outside of the driveway layout, which puts it right in the buffer zone and pretty much, um, you know, within five feet of the edge of the wetland there. Um, after is they pull like, the conduit through. Two, 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 by, uh, two by three foot? 
Yeah. Okay. So it's like it's six square feet and six that it feet. would actually be temporary impact because once they install the silo and the junction box, that portion of the trench will be covered back over and it'll be uh, stabilized, seated, loamed, strawed, whatever needs to be done to get it back to pre-construction conditions. So the only thing you're, that is actually going to be an impact is about 4.5 square feet of above ground impact from that junction box itself, mm -hmm. which is just going to sit right on the edge of the driveway. It will be outside of the wetland, but it is right against uh, the edge of the wetland there. We have talked with the contractors about installing appropriate sediment and erosion controls about any excavation they do need to do because they will have to uh, have pole pits within the driveway layout along the, along the paths to get up to the other transformer. So they intend to put straw waddles or whatever appropriate erosion controls around those as they um, do their test pits to make sure they're not hitting the communication line that's there the electrical line that's there and the water line that's already there. Um, How many test pits? Um, up to five test pits is what they think that they need. And I think one, that's like that's like dig safe stuff. You just you got to dig down. To yeah, to make sure that they're still on the right path. And then they can also put the PVC in through those pits and pull it up the rest of the way. Oh, they're pulling the line. Gotcha. Yeah. There are two culverts that they will plan to go over or under whatever they dictate is the best way to go um, and mitigate those along the driveway. But like I said, every, everything is within driveway um, or considered replacement up in that transformer area. And there's no, there's no, there's no, you're not touching the culverts. There's no replacement or maintenance. Or no, that. they won't need to do anything with those. And just to, I know from the site visit that this transformer box is being moved further out uh, and away from the wetland and that they're putting down rubber mats to get in there with the uh, equipment to remove that box. So that there is a reduction of impact there um, also, just to point that out. Yeah, they're going to completely remove that one and actually place it upland about 20 feet away on a ledge. So it's going to be further back. And they're going to take that old one out and get that completely out because that one sits right on the wetland edge. Um, included in the NOI for the junction box installation, we put a small footprint of temporary matting down, which is also, um, I believe it was 90 square feet. And that is precautionary. So just in case, because they're on the wetland edge, if any of the equipment needs to maneuver off of the driveway, that, any, that, that whole area would actually be protected. And they're not the big temporary timber mats that you often see on transmission lines, but they're like the smaller rubber alternate matting that can support the equipment without causing rutting or permanent damage to the area. They think they can do it all from the driveway, but we, we said, you know, we should probably include it just in case. Okay. Uh, thank you, Virginia. Mm -hmm. Aaron, do you want to share pictures or? Uh, you yes. Get, or just kind of. Bear with me for just one second and I'll pull those open. Uh, sorry, I'm doing a share screen and I've got two two screens, so it, I've got to figure out which one to share. Hold on one second. Uh, there we go. Okay. Um, so this is standing at the residence and looking down. To, uh, the residence is at my back. Uh, there's like a little cul-de-sac kind of at their um, turnaround in front of their house. This is looking out toward um, Southeast Street, and you can see the wetland flagging running um, on both sides of the of the uh, the driveway. This is the existing um, transmission uh, transformer, rather uh, here, and then there's also another piece of equipment there. Um, and then this is pointing to the area where the new transformer would be located. And then this is walking down toward um, Southeast Street. And and in this one, uh, Virginia stance. Sorry, Virginia. <laughs> 
<laughs> standing right where move. the <laughs> right where the um uh the junction box. junction box would be located. Is that yeah. six square feet? Oh, I'm not measuring it, <laughs> but maybe. <laughs> <Close>. <laughs> yeah. So um, I do have uh, other pictures of that area if you guys you know need them from a different view or with vegetation or anything like that. But seems straightforward. The right? um, um, replacement. Commissioner, do you have any questions? I'll, we'll give it to the public in a second. But Commissioner, it seems pretty straightforward here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like the thumbs up, tired eyes and thumbs up. Uh, is there anybody from the public that wants to, has anything to say to this project? Raise your hand. We will give you one second. Okay. If there's nothing outstanding, um, Virginia, it sounds pretty straightforward. I appreciate the little, a couple extra steps you're trying to do. We try to make sure everything gets done on the, on the um, driveway. Um, and using the geotextiles and stuff to move things around. Um, I appreciate that. Um, and obviously, you're going to be working with Aaron, so we want everything, you know, ducks in a row and lines of communication open. Right. So if, there's any, if there's any other questions or comments, um, commissioners, I'd like to see a motion, please. I move to close the public hearing and issue an order of conditions for 797 South East Street with standard boilerplate conditions under WPA and Amherst bylaws. Second that. And Andre with a second. Thank you. Voice vote. Andre? Aye. Michelle? Aye. Cameron? Aye. Alex? Aye. And I for Fletcher. All right. Thank you very much, Virginia. Thank you. Have a nice evening. Yeah, you too. Thanks. Doki. That was good. Thanks, guys. Um, Aaron. Oh, the you emergency cert. Yeah, if you want yeah. to get on that. Yeah, I'll jump right in here. Yeah, let's get on that. That's 133 Bay Road. They have um, water in the basement, sump pump. They had to yes. um, dig a new uh new sump pump drainage um I saw the yeah 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 uh, i don't know if this is going to let me switch screens can you guys see this yes okay um all right so i'm going to give you a little uh, just a sort of a quick um snapshot of this situation um this is the uh this home is located um immediately next door to the ever source montague to fairmont line um this landowner previously had a sump pump in her basement and uh following the ever source work um which was completed this winter uh so this this winter since that time she has had uh serious flooding problems with water coming into her basement um so the issue is sort of twofold. The first is the certificate of compliance, or excuse me, the um, emergency certification, basically to um, repair the um, uh, outlet of the sump pump and bring the water away from the home to try to hopefully um, mitigate the flooding that's happening in her basement. Um, and so that's kind of the main piece that the commission um, uh, we'd be looking for action on tonight. Um, the sump pump line comes off of uh you know it's the entire work is on her property but you can see this is where the um eversource line work was that um it the the outlet comes out near that line and she has a temporary piping pulling it over into this area just to get the water because what was happening was there was so much water coming out of her basement and the area where they were pumping it to was very low lying and flat and when the water was coming out it was going into the road and causing like a giant um freeze a giant frozen uh, uh pond puddle in the roadway dpw had a problem with that because um mm -hmm. it was putting water into the road so they added this temporary measure of the pipe just to carry the water across um uh the right of way so that their water could move down to the lo a low point that wouldn't cause a safety hazard in the roadway. Um, <clears throat> so simultaneous to this, though, there's there's also sort of a, a dispute going on with the landowner and Eversource. Excuse me. 
um, the ever, the owner is basically uh, trying to negotiate with Eversource to address um, some of her concerns relative to the drainage, which she thinks is related to the Eversource right of way. Uh, there's been a lot of emails flying around about this. I've been trying to sort of be an intermediary um, to uh, be supportive of both sides and encourage it resource to um, help where they can to, um, you know, resolve the issue basically. Um, but uh, I don't, th there have been sort of some allegations made by the landowner that Eversource has uh, wetlands violations out there. I visited the site, I reviewed the permit, I issued the original permit. In my opinion, there are no violations on the site. <coughs> I'm losing my voice. There's no violations on the site currently. Um, there are some some changes in the, um, uh, the way that the site, I mean, when the commission issued the permit, they allowed the installation of a new structure. And so there are some changes to the site, but I believe those are permitted changes. So I just wanna be completely transparent that I don't see any violations on the site. Um, I'm not getting in between Eversource and the landowner with regard to her um, private issue, um, just trying to help sort it out so that I can kind of be supportive to all sides. Um, I'm going to end up losing my voice. I yeah. can tell. Thank you, Erin. Uh, so, but that that aside, our jurisdiction for the emergency sir is the trenching and this line going into the wetland for the sump pump. And it looks like the site is in. Um, I think it doesn't look like you had any issues with what was there and what's been done. Um, it doesn't sound like there's any issues with the Eversource uh, line place uh, replacement or structure re replacement. So. <laughs> I think let's just stick with um, the great job. I mean, thank you for um, trying to be a mediator for all this, um, but let's just stick with this emergency um, certification. Um, if you're okay with it, then that's what needed to get done. And that's what got done and got the water out of the basement. Great. Um, I think let's just stick with that right now. Um, whatever happens with Eversource or landowner, that's up to them. Unless there's some egregious um, wetlands violations, we'll, sure, we'll surely get pulled into it and that's okay. That's what we do. But I think let's just um, thank you for doing what you're doing, and let's um, let's just stick with this emergency certification of the trenching getting done. That's for the sump pump drainage. Alex, you got something? Yeah, I was just curious, Aaron. Um, uh, help me out here. What's our jurisdiction? What what what's at stake for us? Yeah. Um, so there, in the Eversource right of way, um, there. Uh, this is the, the the wetland begins in this approximate area. Um, so there's her house, the Eversource line, and then in the Eversource right of way, um, just beyond this limit of work where you can see the disturbance, there's a wetland um, on the, uh, I guess it would be the west side of the um, right of way. And, and this, and I, I just wanna make it clear, Eversource just wrapped up work in the winter of 2022. This straw that you see is their stabilization measures after they removed their um, timber mats. Timber mats. Yeah. So this isn't associated with the work that the landowner is doing. Um, the work that the landowner is doing stops on her property. Other than that, just temporary pipe carrying the water out from away from the road. Her work, I would say this, this section right here is within buffer zone. So most of her property is out of the buffer zone. It's over a hundred feet, over a hundred feet from the wetland. It's just this tiny part. That's, I would say maybe the, the first like 10 or 15, maybe 20 feet of this um, trench from her property line where it meets the Eversource line um, coming east. So are those red flags, wetland flags? No, I think that those are dig safe um, for utilities. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so we're just uh, that's our jurisdiction right there, Alex. Is from that where her pointer is. I'm using my pointer. You can see it. Yeah, um, the buffer is so like twenty feet, probably about like buffer. here or yeah, something. Yeah, and this okay. is to the to the straw, which is yeah. the right okay. of ever source right away. Right. Thank you. I'm done. I don't need any more. Thank you. Thank you for the uh, clarification, though. That's very important. No, it's a good question. Um, I think if we can get a motion to um, 
or ratify this emergency cert. That'd be excellent. Um, I move to ratify emergency certification for 133 Bay Road. Second. Thank you. Uh, voice vote, Cameron. Aye. Michelle. Aye. Andre. Aye. Alex. Aye. And I for Fletcher. Hey, um, do you want to push through, Aaron? Do you want to just call it? Um, um it's totally business. Yeah, it's totally up Come to on. you. Um, this one was just received today. Um, I still have to look into it a little more. No, it got received today. We needed it on Friday. Sorry, um, I appreciate it. With new parking mm -hmm. area, we can pick that up on another one. Um, we talked about Hickory Ridge communication with DPW. Um, memo drafted we haven't reviewed it we, we can we will review that memo this is what we're um, dpw we're trying to get a blank noi due to a violation that happened maybe i can call uh dave or something and we can get the i don't know do we need the town manager involved in this one to maybe help mediate that's a different topic of conversation but um yeah i mean i think maybe we issue the memo and then just try to have a dialogue with DPW about it and see where it goes. It's it's totally up to you guys. Um, there is a memo drafted in the correspondence folder of the OneDrive. Um, if anybody has any edits to that, I'm hoping to be getting that out in the next week. So if anybody has comments on it, you can just send them along to me or okay. if you wanna bring it up tonight, you're welcome to. Okay. Um, if, if somebody in the commission could look over it and just get a couple views on it. At least we can get that memo out and start getting that ball rolling that would be appreciated i can look at it as well it's it's right in our packet just in the one drive and yep okay um i think that's that's doable and we'll get that it'd be nice to get that memo out and so hopefully we'll get a response and we could just try to get this um get this moving a little bit more i think that's good we're good aaron you gotta go to bed um <laughs> I think we need a motion to adjourn here, folks. I move to adjourn at uh, 9.05 p.m. Thank you. Second. Thank you, Andre. Voice vote, Cameron. Aye. Andre. Aye. Michelle. Aye. Alex. Aye. And I for Fletcher. Good night, everybody. Good night, everyone. Good night. Get well, Thank you very much, Aaron. Thank you Thanks, all. Have a good night. Bye. Bye. Thanks for all your work, Aaron. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Yes. Bye.